welcome everybody to another segment of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck, and of course that means some smart talk radio, of course, is in your future in this segment. Uh, certainly going to be a good one. We're very pleased to have with us Glenn Frankel. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, university professor. He's an author of The Searchers, The Making of an American Legend, a New York Times and L.A. Times bestseller. He was also the director of the School of Journalism at the University of Texas in Austin, visiting professor at Stanford. Before that, he was a longtime Washington Post reporter, editor and bureau chief in London, South Africa, and Jerusalem. Uh, Won the 1989 Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting for Balance and Sensitive Reporting of Israel and the First Palestinian Uprising. going to be talking about an exciting new work called High Noon, The Hollywood Blacklist and the Making of an American Classic. Should be a a fascinating conversation uh, indeed. Glenn, uh, how are you, my friend? I'm fine, Warner. Thanks for having me on. Is it cold in Kansas today? Uh, Right this second, it is not. But uh, by the time this airs, uh, it may very well be. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, let's see what happens. You never know around here. Well, let's do this. Uh, 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 journalism, uh, investigative journalism, but also just some creative journalism. And uh, uh, authorship has been an important part of your life. What led you uh, to the pen? Oh, well, I always wanted to be a writer ever since I was a kid. And, you know, I went to college and got out and tried to write a novel and some poems. And it's a funny thing. I I, I couldn't make a living doing that. Uh, Nobody was buying my poetry and my novel wasn't getting done. And it kind of occurred to me finally that if I was going to be a writer, I was going to have to make a living. And journalism, newspapers, especially in those days, because this was in the 70s and, you know, Watergate was just going on. The Washington Post was a big deal. It occurred to me that maybe I could get paid if I were for a newspaper, and it was just as simple as that. I got awfully lucky, actually. I moved to Richmond, Virginia with my wife and got a job south of Richmond, paid $1.65 an hour, um, and, yep. <laughs> you know, which was tough. But at the same time, almost from the first day, I, I could see that this would work for me, that I liked not only the right, getting paid to write, but I liked being the, the journalist who's sort of outside of things but gets to know a community well. Well, um, and it's been a good fit. That was like 40 years ago, and I kind of haven't stopped since then. Well, this is a little bit off topic, but I thought as long as I've got you here, uh, again, you grew up uh, it, it, at, not at an assignment desk, but you knew what an assignment desk was. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure did. As time goes on, and so many uh, of the dailies are going to the wayside for lots of different reasons. Where are America's next generation of young reporters going to come from, especially those that report in any kind of a print medium? Well, that's a really good question, and the answer, of course, is not simple. And I, to be honest, I can't say for sure. All I know for sure is we need information, we need news, we need reliable, factual information more than ever before. You know, when the horse and buggy went out of business, the transport that wasn't the end of transportation. It was just the end of the horse and buggy, and that may be true of the old-fashioned newspaper in some ways. But I, I'm actually very hopeful. It's an interesting time right now because. You know, on one level, the President of the United States considers journalists to be the enemy of the people. But I can't think of a time when journalism, when real journalism wasn't as needed as it is now to hold people in power accountable, whether they're in the government or or elsewhere in society. And I think we're seeing a bit of a renaissance, certainly in some of the mainstream news organizations like my alma mater, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Their subscriptions are going up right now because people are desperate to get reliable information, and that's that's the card we have to play. So I'm optimistic that whether uh, the kids who are coming through now, and I ran the School of Journalism at the University of Texas for four years, and I love the kids who came through my school, you know, that these kids are still going to have gainful employment looking for information. I just don't know what particular medium they're going to be doing it in, what devices they're going to be doing it, but but we're desperate for it, and, I'm, and to have a working democracy, we've got to have it. I was going to say, regardless uh, of the political aisle that you're on, your political perspective, the relationship now between at least the White House uh, and the media is an absolute mess. And I'm curious as to, from your opinion, what fixes that? I don't think anything fixes it. I think it's, first of all, a natural state. 
Um, to a great extent, we had it under Richard Nixon. Bill Clinton didn't care for the Washington Post very much. Uh, President Obama <laughs> didn't care for him either. So on one level, you know, that's, that's the way it goes, and, uh, and that's the way it should go, because the press's job under the First Amendment is to hold people in power accountable, and that's not always fun. The difference right now is, of course, our new president, uh, I don't know if he's read the First Amendment, um, but he clearly not only dislikes the press intensely, uh, but at the same time uses them as a punching bag, as a foil for, as a rhetorically and in other ways. He can be quite ple- pleasant in person. I haven't met him, but I know a number of my former colleagues who have, and he can be very charming, and he reads the New York Times. He was very accessible during the campaign and talking to journalists um, and giving interviews. So, you know, it's it's we're getting a picture right now that may be a little bit one sided, but that's because of his own rhetoric. I think he and his his people really do see the press as a great punching bag. And um, that's fine rhetorically, I suppose, for him. But I think it's very dangerous for American democracy. Well, okay, uh, boy, that's a show in and of itself. Uh, but Glenn, we'll, we'll, <laughs> sure we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> we'll do that. that. <laughs> let's uh, let's uh, try to redirect here. Uh, a fascinating work called High Noon: The Hollywood Blacklist and the Making of an American Classic. Um, again, High Noon, an iconic American film. Grace Kelly, uh, her first real major role, and uh, and Gary Cooper, obviously. Uh, during the month-long making of this film, uh, lots of other things, though, were going along in the political landscape that directly affected uh, those uh, making this film and in that same artistic and, and uh, movie-making community. Share with us a little bit of that background, and we'll do, then we'll start getting more particular and specific as we go along. Well, you're you're absolutely right. High Noon was made in 1951, which is the height of the Red Scare and the blacklist, and not only in Hollywood, but the sort of hunt for subversives, communists, uh, people who we couldn't trust, allegedly, in government, in the schools, and in Hollywood. And this begins after World War II. We won the war, and that was great, but uh, after that, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, our charismatic president, is dead. The, the, the spoil of victory are not so great in some ways, even though the economy is pretty good. But the Soviet Union becomes an enemy, and, you know, we're locked in a Cold War. We've got the A-bomb, but they're rapidly getting one. It's a time of high anxiety and great fear in the society. And folks come along who say, this is the fall of outsiders. This is communism. This is infiltration. They're out to get us. And the House on american Activities Committee holds hearings on communist infiltration. They inevitably come to Hollywood. Hollywood, which is a great platform for anybody. I mean, you call, you know, movie stars as witnesses. You get a lot of free press. They come out there and they begin to hunt for for subversion in the in the film business. And um, the guy who was writing the script for High Noon, whose idea it was, a man named Carl Foreman, who'd been a member of the, the small Communist Party in Hollywood in the late 1930s and early 40s, um, and it left the party. His career is going great guns. He's been nominated a couple of times for an Academy Award, and he will be for High Noon as well. Well, he gets called to testify. So while he's writing the last part of the script, which is about a lawman who faces, you know, people who are coming to kill him and who's trying to rally the community behind him, he's beginning to feel a little bit like the lawman. And he's beginning to pour a little bit of that political meaning and his own personal struggle into the script. When you see High Noon today, you can't really tell that it has a political point to it. It's just a great movie. Um, But I think it really enriches uh, your viewing of High Noon if you know the political background behind it. And also, I'm sorry, I can't help but, you know, uh, hear the echoes, the resonances between that time when people were angry, when the rhetoric was very toxic, when all kinds of false accusations were flying back and forth, when people could lose their jobs and their livelihood without any kind of due process. I, I, I feel some of those echoes. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the book has gotten a lot of interest early on, because, you know, American history is fraught with lots of times when our democracy is under threat. And 1951 and the Red Scare was definitely one of those times. 
Glenn, uh, how uh, divided was the Hollywood community, whether actors, writers, directors, producers, et cetera? Um, even though they were the target uh, in many of these cases, there were still people in Hollywood that believed that it was sort of okay, did they not? Well, very much so. In fact, there were people in what was called the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, whose president was somebody you might have vaguely heard of. His name was John Wayne. Oh, yeah. Anyway, John Wayne and gossip columnist Hedda Hopper and a number of these folks are leading the charge and inviting HUAC, the House on american Activities Committee, to come to Hollywood. And so out they come. And Gary Cooper, who's the star of High Noon, was a charter member of this Motion Picture Alliance. And he's a conservative Republican like Wayne. But the difference is that Cooper... Cooper makes High Noon, and he's fabulous in it, and really one of the people who you know contributes to its greatness, I think. He gets to know Carl Foreman because they work together on the movie, and he likes Carl, and he you know comes to trust him. And so when the push comes to shove and Carl is subpoenaed to testify, Cooper supports him. He thinks he's a reliable guy. Wayne, on the other hand, feels that Carl needs to cooperate with the committee, to not, not only denounce communism, but also to name the names of other people that he'd been in the party with, um, if he's going to clear himself and if he's going to be able to keep working. And Carl wants to keep working. I mean, he really does. He loves his career. But at the same time, to name other people, his former friends, um, to accuse them of something before a congressional committee, it's a, it's a bridge too far for him. So you have what I really love when I'm working as a writer, a situation where a man really faces, a, a, if you will, an existential crisis over what he's willing to do and where he's willing to draw the line. And my book tries to focus on the personal costs uh, uh, for people who got caught up in this sort of repressive moment. What uh, and you said you saying that that as far as the writing is concerned, that part of the of reality, the reality play going on outside, found its way into the movie. Uh, did you do you think again? You mentioned it's possible that today's viewer may not know it, but with background like what you're talking about, uh, where does it come out in the film? Give us a couple of examples. Well, I would say the main example. Warner is in the way that the, the, the treatment of the town, it's called Hadleyville in the movie. It's where the lawman, Will Kane, by, played by Gary Cooper, where he presides, and where the uh, sort of evil guy he had ousted there and sent to prison is coming back to get him and bringing along and, and meeting three hired killers, and they're going to come for him. The lawman goes from house to house in Hadleyville that morning. He's just gotten married. He was going to leave town, but these bad guys are coming. He goes to his friends. He goes to the town councilors. He even goes to the church service because it's a Sunday morning, and he knows a large part of the respectable end of the community are in church. And he pleads with these people to stand with him the way they had done originally when they put this guy in prison. And he finds, to his surprise and shock, that they won't stand by him. It's partly cowardice. They don't want to, you know, they're scared of getting killed. But there's some uh, kind of moral corruption going on. They shun him, and they, they, they won't say to him outright, look, you, you know, we, we don't want to help you, but they won't help him. And that's where Carl Foreman, I think, is, is writing about the things he heard in Hollywood when the committee was coming back to town. The people he used to be close to who suddenly didn't have any time for him or were literally crossing the street to avoid him. Um, his friends in the small independent film company he was working at who were afraid that if Carl didn't cooperate with the committee, he would get blacklisted and they would be blacklisted, that they would somehow be identified with him. All this, you know, Carl's feeling very alone here, very solitary, left on his own. And you, and that's what he, you know, you see more of that in the movie. The script gets more like that. He didn't talk about it, because that would have been the kiss of death to the movie if he'd said, oh, hey, guys, by the way, I'm writing an anti-blacklist movie. <laughs> because in 1951, that wasn't going to fly. But it was there, and John Wayne, of all people, he could smell it out. He knew, first of all, what Carl was. But he, he understood that there was, you might call it anti-populist, I'm not sure, but it's certainly there's a critique, let's say, of the community in there that is very much Carl writing about his circumstances. If you just joined us, here's Shirley Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck, uh, as each and every week. Uh, 
and some Smart Talk Radio rolling along here. Got a great guest, uh, Glenn Frankel, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, university professor and author, uh, currently uh, talking about a brand new work called High Noon, The Hollywood Blacklist and the Making of an American Classic, of which High Noon certainly is. Glenn, uh, for those of uh, listeners that uh, may not remember back then, uh, share with us a little bit, a little bit about the political climate in that early 1950s uh, that would allow for the rise of something like HUAC. Well, you know, it really begins after World War II, as I said earlier, but the Republicans take back both houses of Congress for the first time in a dozen years. They're taking names. They're getting ready to, you know, run, run, run a presidential contest. And so they begin to look for point, pressure points. And the anti-communist thing really plays on people's fears. And so by 19, they come in first, the committee comes in 47, and Hollywood tries to resist a little bit then. They don't want, you know, some congressman to tell them who to hire and fire. But by 51, Hollywood really is very submissive. They're selling less tickets in those days. They're feeling economically vulnerable. And they certainly don't want to get to, you know, someone like the American Legion or a citizens group to boycott them because that's going to hurt them even more. So the pressure's on Hollywood to cooperate. And people are called to testify. Some of them who want to keep their jobs, it's perfectly understandable. They end up naming a few names or a lot of names, just trying to find their way through it. Um, Others don't. Others refuse to do that. And the ones who don't lose their jobs, lose their jobs right away. And it becomes a situation in Hollywood where after a while, if you want to work, you've either got to sign a loyalty oath or you've got to be able to show your employer, the studio that's going to employ you, that you're in the clear, that you don't have anything hanging over your head. Because if you do, they're going to hire somebody else to be the cameraman or the supporting actor. They don't need the headache. And it's that situation. Again, without any trials, without any, you know, your lawyer isn't going to be able to help you unless you're willing to cooperate. That's what it boils down to. What about uh, High Noon is is such a popular movie, uh, and if younger people have not seen it, they should. But it was extremely popular uh, amongst presidents, and I'd like to get your take on that. Yeah, it's really interesting. I found out Dwight Eisenhower loved it. Somebody recalls watching it with him at the White House, and he's saying to Cooper, get out of there, run out, you know, to get away from the bad guys. It's because it's such an exciting movie. And then Bill Clinton was the champion. He, he screened it at the White House something like 20 times. I think presidents, you know, Warner, they're, once they get to office, it's a lonely job, isn't it? Because you've got all that responsibility on your shoulders, and sometimes your political allies aren't really there with you when the tough decisions have to be made, or at least presidents feel that way. They, they feel, you know, like they're on their own, and who can blame them? And so High Noon speaks to them. I think it's really extraordinary. Here we are 65 years after that movie. It was made on a very low budget. It's black and white. Um, you know, it doesn't have beautiful landscapes or the usual cattle drives or any of that stuff. Yet it's a movie that's really endured, both because it's so beautifully put together and 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 it resonates so much in so many ways with our spirit with what we think we are and 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 ask that question well okay if you were faced with this crisis what would you do I'm curious as to again those that made the movie some may still be alive uh, many probably are not or associated with it what was the primary source uh of your research and and was it easy or was it tough for you well, you know, I've done this a couple of times now, and I've been a journalist for so long. I wouldn't call it easy, but it sure was fun. I mean, everyone involved in the making of the movie, with the exception of one actress who whose role was actually cut in the actual film, they've all passed on, and, and my major characters died many years ago. So I'm looking at archives. Um, the Motion Picture Academy has a wonderful library that has uh, Fred Zinneman, the director's papers, and it has the papers of, of, of other folks involved. I, I look at those papers. I go to the National Archives here in Washington, D.C. I live just outside of Washington, and I can see all the files of the House on american Activities Committee, including files that have made, been made public in the last 10 or 15 years that haven't been written about much before. Also, I look for the families. Um, In each case, Gary Cooper's daughter, Maria Cooper, was enormously helpful and generous with her time. Carl Foreman's widow, Eve Foreman, who's remarried, and and Carl and Eve's uh, son, Jonathan, were were great helps to me. 
uh, Stanley Kramer's widow, Karen Kramer. In each case, I found relatives, um, you know, children for the most part, or, or the surviving spouses, um, to help me along. And I found, for example, Carl had done a whole series of, of interviews with a friend. He was hoping to write his own memoir, but then he was busy, and then he developed brain cancer and died rather quickly. I got access to those things. So it's a combination of talking to real people. And, you know, Warner, i got to confess to you, I'm, I'm just an old journalist. I don't know that much about movies. I know a lot about two movies now, <laughs> The Searchers and High Noon. But I go talk to people who do. I talk to film historians. I talked to folks who are historians of the blacklist, the Larry Suplair and Victor Navasky, the folks who wrote books that, that were published 30, 35 years ago that are wonderful studies of the Hollywood blacklist. I just make my way around and read everything I can. And I love doing it. I mean, meeting people, yeah, but also just digging deep into files and looking for characters to write about. For the, And sometimes for people who have been a little bit overlooked, it's it's this was as good a process, as more fun to do than any any book I think I've ever gotten involved in. Right, a little bit of uh, kind of work candy for you. And uh, well, to t- I don't want to take the candy away from you, but I do want to ask this question <laughs> before we get out of here. And and uh, just a general observations here. We are in a climate. I don't care what anybody says. The media and the president, uh, the White House, right now are on one another in a very, very big way. And you can you can point fingers all kinds of ways. But again, I'd like to go back from your perspective as a journalist. Um, it's certainly not good for the country. Uh, the the media, of course, needs to be a watchdog, and and certainly it's fine for the politicians to call the media out. This this seems decidedly personal. Uh, it's decidedly vicious. Not sure exactly who's getting the benefit from any of this because it doesn't feel like uh, new, truthful information is coming out from either side. But uh, I'm curious as to what you believe, Glenn, your role as a journalist is, what should it be, and what should the role of the media, so to speak, and I'll, I'll just – I'll reduce it that down to the news media – be in yep. reporting on what's happening in Washington? Well, that's a great, great question. And I think it does transcend this question of, you know, whether you're conservative or liberal, where you are, you know, who you voted for. I think we're all Americans, and we all have a stake in this. And what we have is a stake in our democracy. And there's going to be adversarial relationships between the press and the government. There should be. Because, as you point out, they have different roles, and they're meant to be checks on each other in many ways. That's how it was set up. And it it works pretty well. It's always had rough edges, and it always will. But there are times when everything is at stake, and I'm afraid this is one of those times. The press, you know, I can tell you about it from a journalist point of view. When the president goes after the Washington Post or the New York Times, man, that just tells me I've got to work harder. I've got to make sure to be as fair as I can be. And my Pulitzer Prize was for working in the Middle East, and I got it for being balanced and sensitive was the terms they used at the time. So that doesn't make me special. That's what we're supposed to do. And you're absolutely right. Sometimes we don't succeed in doing it. Um, But that's the job, and that doesn't change no matter who is president and no matter how much he or she or whoever doesn't like us. And so I look at it from that point of view, um, that we've got to keep at it. It's more valuable than ever to try to come up with accurate, fair, even-handed information, because that's one of the engines that, you know, that's one of the fuels for the engine of democracy. If people don't have independent, accurate information, they can't make decisions about their lives, and they certainly can't make decisions about their leaders. So that's our job. Uh, We don't do it perfectly. We often fail at it. But if we don't do it, frankly, nobody will. And that's that's my perspective on it. And, you know, uh, there's a long way to go in this presidency, and things are going to – I'm afraid things are going to get worse before they get better. And I don't know how it will turn out, but I know exactly what the press's role needs to be. And the great institutions, and I think you're seeing more subscriptions to the Washington Post and the New York Times, for example, I think they're rising to the occasion. Yeah, well, I tend to agree with you. I do think they're going to get worse before they get better. I I know the country cannot tolerate or hopefully will not tolerate another 47 months of the way things are right now. But uh, anyway, well, we have been talking to Glenn Frankel, uh, New York Times uh, bestselling author of The Searchers, and a brand new work called High Noon, The Hollywood Blacklist and the Make of an American Classic. Uh, he currently writes for The Washington Post and does a variety of other things. Uh, what about a next project for you? What uh, I know you're probably tired from this one, but what's your next one? 
Well, that's a really good question. You'd be surprised. It's a little harder to find. I'm looking for another great movie or a great work of popular culture. It could be a novel or something that really resonates in American history. And, you know, I fell in. I was so lucky to just high noon sort of fell into my lap. Um, so it's not easy to come up with. I'm looking at a few things, um, again, and I haven't really decided. But, boy, I need to decide pretty soon because I like this. I want to, you know, this is what I'm doing, and I want to keep doing it, and I, and I don't want to grind my wheels too much longer. I just hope, you know, I, it's uh, to be able to write about a great movie like that and the wonderful people who put it together is just an added thing that makes this a really special little subgenre I just stumbled into. So I'm looking hard, Warner. Well, if you want if you wanted to stay in the westerns, uh, I think the fine work Blazing Saddles, of course, should be on your radar screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be a change of pace, wouldn't it? I, I love Mel Brooks, and I remember seeing that movie. Um, yeah, there are a lot of good westerns out there. We'll see. We'll see. I've, you know, so many great movies. Um, I won't. I won't. Ha- you know, I'll find something, but it's got to work, and it, and and it's got to be doable. So we'll see. All right. Well, listen, Glenn. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, best of luck, and congrats on a, a really fascinating piece here called High Noon. Well, Warner, thanks for your time. This was really fun. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. one more thing before we go. I'm so sorry. How can people find out a little bit more about the work that Glenn Frankel does and also, of course, pick up a, a copy of the book or some of the other work you've done? Well, you can go on Amazon.com or the Barnes & Noble website and order it that way. You can go to your local bookstore because the book was published today. My website is glennfrankel.com. And uh, you can the, the, there are buttons there where you can order it online from people, but you can also uh, find out more about me and even drop me a line and tell me what you thought of the book. Um, I answer every email, and I love to hear from people. So those are all the ways to get started. Sounds good. Well, listen, again, best of luck. Uh, thank you so much. And we will be back with more right after this.